Huh, that was weird. The most complicated eyes in the animal kingdom we think belong to the mantis shrimp. It has the most complicated visual system of any animal that we know of. They can see in the range of visible light from deep ultraviolet all the way to far red, not quite infrared. And each one of their eyes has trinocular vision. Both of our eyes together gives us binocular vision, which gives us depth perception. But each one of its individual eyes has trinocular vision, which means each one of its eyes alone has depth perception. That's amazing. I'm bringing all of that up because on this week's episode of Because Science, we were talking about the predator and how it could see in infrared. And I, as many of you brought up, it can see in infrared, but it uses technology to help select which wavelengths of light it wants to see. The mantis shrimp does the same thing. Scientists have discovered that it can alter the pigments in its eyes, change their expression, such that it will be more sensitive to certain kinds of light than others, depending on what environment it's in. It can change in real time. So, the mantis shrimp kind of has predator eyes and predator-like vision technology, except it doesn't need any technology. Nature already figured that out. Hello and welcome to another edition of Because Science Live, the live show version of Because Science, where I take all your comments, questions, and corrections live, and sometimes flub lines, because that's what live shows are for. I have occasional voice of the void, Nate here. I always say occasional, but it's always that voice. Uh, Nate, uh, what we got? Let's answer some nerdy questions. Let's do it. Hmm. From Robert Messiah. Just look at look at it. It's just a it's just a little peacock murder machine. Love it. Sorry, please continue. From Robert Masaya, is there any friction to worry about in space? Can a spaceship be any shape and not have uh, to factor in friction? Okay, so the cool thing about space is that because there is no air resistance, because there's no air, the ship designs don't have to be exactly uh, sleek. They don't have to look like a space shuttle. I mean, You want something to be space shuttle shaped if you're getting out into space. But if you are leaving the Earth and you are already in space, then let's say say a a hyper-advanced civilization is on Earth and they have uh, advanced enough technology that instead of launching ships off of the surface, they can build ships already in space. Spase, like this, and uh, so it can already be in orbit. Let's say we have a lot of technology that lets us build stuff in orbit without going down to Earth, and you can build a ship in space. So what that what would that ship look like? Because it doesn't have to enter and exit Earth's atmosphere, then it doesn't have to have the same kind of robustness that you would want from a space shuttle that would need heat shielding and uh, and and all the associated architecture of the space shuttle and how it lands and how it takes off and that's hard on the ship. A realistic spaceship built in space in some near future uh, technology would probably be by Earth standards relatively fragile. That being said, you can make it pretty much any shape because there is no air resistance in space. That's why, (laughs) uh, you know what I'm going to say, that's why I like ships like they show on the Expanse now on Amazon, thanks to us, I'm pretty sure, um, I'm streaming on Amazon because they basically just look like boxes. And that's all you need. Because there's no air resistance in space, you can have uh, non-aerodynamically shaped spaceships because aerodynamics isn't, uh, isn't a pressure out there. Now, then, yes, you could, you could build a spaceship pretty much of any shape. However, there is a sort of friction that you may encounter. I don't think humans will ever encounter it, um, or anything for that matter, because it's a matter of physics, but there is a certain kind of friction that if you were, let's say you are in space, and you are traveling, and you are traveling close to the speed of light. Let's say 99% the speed of light. Well, at 99% the speed of light, you are going fast enough that even 
this, the, the rarefied air of space. There's, there's very few atoms and molecules in space per its volume. It's, 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 uh, it's not very dense at all. It's just an atom or molecule for every cubic centimeter or so, which is a small amount of space, but there's a lot of atoms in our air. Anyway, space is the most empty thing there is, but there are little atoms and molecules floating around. Now, if you go this fast, you are going fast enough to hit enough of those lonely particles in space that there's a sort of drag that is put on you just from those lonely mo molecules. And uh, because you're moving so fast, they hit you energetically enough that it would irradiate you and the entire ship uh, fast enough to give everyone on board a lethal dose of radiation uh, within one second give or take. So, is there drag in space? Depends on what you mean. Is there air drag? No. But is there a ultimate form of drag if you go fast enough? Yes. It's kind of like a light speed drag, which is a concept that I would love to see in any of the science fiction that maybe you will write. What's next? From our own Courtney Kraft. Oh, hey, Courtney. How viable is a Vulcan neck pinch to knock someone out? Okay. That's a good one. So, the the I, I don't know anything about it, but they, so the Vulcan, the Vulcan neck pinch is I think you, you pinch about here, right? I think you pinch about here, is that, yeah. Uh, and it immediately knocks the person out. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how much information I can give about what I'm about to say. Anyway, um, so, so I, I've always, you've probably always heard about pressure points on the body points at which you can apply some pressure and it will hurt more than other parts of the body. Now, I think that is true. Some parts of the body are, are more sensitive, have more nerve endings, and you can cause more pain there as opposed to other places, like the back, in your, back of your neck versus, you know, the bottom of your heel. Different. But I, I never subscribe to the idea that pressure points were any kind of magical, mystical, you know, life force kind of conduit thing. All that being said, there are points on your body that you can press into that will kind of do a Vulcan neck grip kind of thing. Um, ah, have to be careful here. Hmm. Because of uh, there, there, there's a point. There, there are two points on your body that if you applied pressure to both of them simultaneously, uh, it would change the oxygen flow to your brain and it can make a person pass out within a few seconds. Do not try that at home. But it's right here on, your, on, on those veins. What's next? From Milk or arteries? Kulof. Arteries. Don't, it's basically choking. You, you choke someone out. I mean, basically. But I don't know of any other uh, uh, immediate pressure points that are, and nothing that fast. Nothing like, ah. Uh, Hey, Mr. Spock, I love your haircut. Uh. Hey, did your ears get pointier? Uh. Yeah, I never had good inter interactions with that man. I'm sorry, what was next? From Milk Kilof. Cool. In, in the new Godzilla movie, Ghidorah yes. is said to cause massive hurricanes only mm. with the flapping of its wings. How scientifically accurate is that? I was already shaking my head before the question was, was done. Um, so hurricanes are in the news. Unfortunately, they're going to keep happening and get worse. Uh, hurricanes are in the news a lot. So how big now? I mean, well, your question is, could a giant creature such as one in um, Godzilla create hurricanes with the uh, flapping of its wings? I would say absolutely not. If you are go online and look at any of the pictures that are being returned uh, from the ISS, the International Space Station, of the hurricane that is currently um, just made landfall in North and South Carolina, I believe. Uh, hurricanes are incredibly massive uh, atmospheric systems. They are, uh, it is so much air and so much matter moving around that you would need for a creature to do that kind of thing not only would it have to be many, many, many miles across or kilometers across, um, 
which would be biologically impossible probably. It would have to create a local weather system that would also support a hurricane. So a hurricane isn't just fast winds. It is, it is a, a circulating uh, weather system where hot and cold air and moisture, uh, moisture from over the top of the ocean is fueling this hurricane. It's not just a single gust of wind. It's sustaining itself from moisture and heat and the differential of temperatures, that kind of thing. So. Even if a giant creature was giant enough, I don't think it could alter the local environment enough to create a self-sustaining hurricane. However, maybe what the uh, maybe what Godzilla means they don't, but let's make it work. Maybe what they could mean is that uh, the creature creates hurricane force winds with the flapping of its wings. So uh, winds that have a certain velocity that coincide with the different categories of a hurricane. Now, I don't know uh, the, the wind speeds off the top of my head, but I know when you get around to category four, category five, you have, you're talking about winds that are, uh, what is it? I'm, I'm speculating, but I think it's winds somewhere between uh, 100, <laughs> I'm in an infinite void. I'm not running out of space. Between 100 and 150 uh, miles per hour, I think. Uh, it's MPH for all of your international viewers. Um, 100 to 150 miles per hour, something like It's in that range. Um, so could you have a creature that could create a gust of wind in that range? Sure. I, I think you could probably move a wing that fast if it was a kaiju or something. So. Hurricane created by a Mothra type creature? No. Hurricane force winds? Maybe. <laughs> because science. <laughs> What's next? From Jonathan Joe Nathan. If Peter Parker created the webs biologically, mm. like in the Tobey Maguire movies, yes. could he actually shoot far enough to reach other buildings? Yeah, so in the Tobey Maguire movies, uh, which are worse than the Spider Man game that just came out, I. I, we can all, I think we can all agree. If you've played the new Spider-Man game, it's like a great Spider-Man movie, which there hasn't been so far. So it's <laughs> just taking shots. Um, yeah, the movies are bad. Uh, so um, in the Tobey Maguire movie, he has biological um, spinnerets, like a spider would have, I guess, which are kind of like, just look like gl gross globs of pus on his wrist. And he presses down and then shoots out. Now. Uh, I think your question is, could there be a system where you'd have enough pressure behind whatever that biological system is to shoot a web out of yourself uh, unaided mechanically uh, to go you know, across a street, you know, 10 meters, 20 meters, something like that, so you can be swinging around New York? Um, I don't know. Um, I do not know if any creatures harness um, pressure quite like, th well, hmm. I know some spiders do shoot webs out of their spinnerets at some distance. So uh, I think there is something there. I would just have to run the numbers for a uh, for silk that a human could swing on and how far it has to go. Because if spiders shoot webs out of their spinnerets, they're not, relatively speaking, they're only going you know a few body lengths away. They're not shooting you know the equivalent of across the street for them. Uh, or at least I don't. I can't think of a spider that does that. So um, I don't know if there's a biological system that would allow that would allow that to happen. Um, I can't think of one live. But all of that made me think of something. Um, there's a uh, canonically, as I was researching the Spider-Man episode, Peter Parker's mechanical web shooters uh, that he puts on his wrists have kind of like a trip wire. Uh, well, you know, he has to press down onto his wrist like that to get the webs to fire. Well, how could he make sure that his webs are not going to just uh, accidentally fire if he was, cr you know, crawling on a wall or punching bad guys, you know, he had to make a fist. How can you make sure he doesn't accidentally activate that? Well, I discovered that this has a 65 pound uh, resistance to it. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried to lift 65 pounds or move 65 pounds with just your fingertips, but I actually have. Uh, I, uh, I've been rock climbing for the last 
11 years or so, eh, I dare say I'm okay at it. And being able to move 65 pounds with just your fingertips is almost a superhuman, it's not quite superhuman, but it is, it is an incredible amount of force. Uh, you, can, you can test this with uh, grip strength gauges. And uh, I think mine, when I did mine, was around 30 or 40 pounds, which is half of this. So if Spider-Man is canonically my height and weight, which he is, uh, or thereabouts, then if he's the same sized human as me, it would make sense that this would be a good scale up for that grip strength if he was already good at gripping. Just a, just a little fun fact for you. Try, no, actually don't try that. Don't try putting 65 pounds in your fingertips if you're not ready for it. It can rupture a tendon. Trust me, I've ruptured two. What's next? From Matthias Almeida, mm. can light vibrate air molecules and produce some kind of sound? Can light vibrate air molecules and create some kind of sound? Oh, I feel like there's something that's not coming to mind that is obvious. Um, hmm. Well, uh, the first thing that I think of, um, it's not really light, is it? Hmm. Well, okay, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that does that. Hmm. Well, well, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. how about this? Something that uh, produces light can wiggle air molecules around enough that you will hear it. Um, that is this very uh, interesting concept that only uh, you know, ancient scientists discovered, which is called lightning. Lightning is, uh, it emits light as a uh, as charges are equalized between something like a cloud and something like the ground, uh, positive and negative charges. And when they equalize each other, uh, electrons race up into the sky um, and down from the sky. And at, at a, a significant fraction, the speed of light, actually, I think it's 30 to 50%, something crazy. And uh, when that happens, there's a release of electrical energy uh, so much, so much so that uh, it heats up the air around the lightning so quickly that it creates pressure waves that we interpret as thunder. So a very uh, light-based thing can produce sound waves that are uh, very loud. I know it's not quite what you asked, um, which is like, could there be a flashlight powerful enough to hum? I mean, I think a lights. I think that's what the lightsaber hum is as well. It's kind of like um, it's kind of like thunder. It's kind of like force thunder. If you have a ultra hot uh, lightsaber that is heating up the air around it as you move it past, it might like that. So I hope you like those two non-answers to your question. If you can think of one in the chat, put it in put it in the YouTube comments. What's up? Next. <laughs> what well, what is up? Is there an up in here? Who could say? What's next? From Natalie Simmons, is it possible to actually melt metal with magnetic induction? Oh yeah, big time. Uh, it's called induction heating. And if you ever look up a video called induction, just search for uh, induction heating on YouTube, for example, and you'll find a very cool video uh, of exactly what you're talking about. Um, not, so uh, yeah, so let, let's, let's, let's go through it. So in induction heating, you can have something like a coil of wire. And if you have a coil of wire and you run electricity through it, it creates a companion magnetic field. And if you have a coil of wire, uh, when it's in this uh, orientation, it's called a solenoid, pretty sure. Um, when you have this uh, orientation, the magnetic field that is produced comes into and out of the coil like so, so there's a magnetic field happening. Right hand rule. Yes. Yeah. So there's a, <laughs> so there's a magnetic field happening inside, uh, inside of the coil of wire. Now, when you have uh, a magnetic field, when the magnetic field is changing, flux, flux capacitor. That's where they get that word. 
when there's a magnetic flux, when there's a changing magnetic field, that changing magnetic field will also create its own electrical field, since elect, uh, it's called electromagnetism, right? Electric fields can create magnetic fields and vice versa. So if you had something inside of this coil that would be electrically conductive, like metal, then if you move around a lot of electric, uh, if you move it uh, through this, and a lot of electricity is produced inside of the metal, the metal absorbs that energy as heat, and it starts to heat up. I think all this is correct. So if I were to put something metal inside of this coil and turn it on and have a current that was changing so that the magnetic field was changing, alternating current, I think, again, I'm a little rusty on this, on uh, physics 103. Uh, it would create an electric current in the metallic thing, and it would heat it up like a resistor heats up when electricity flows through it. Now, search for electric induction on YouTube, and you can find a piece of metal that is inside of a coil just like this, that the magnetic field is strong enough that it's actually levitating inside of the, inside of the coil off the ground, and also heating up. So it's floating inside while it heats up and it gets so hot that it melts but it still retains its shape more or less because it's inside the confines of a magnetic field. And when the guy turns off the electricity, it drops to the ground and splatters because it's molten metal. How cool is that? Also, alternative wind condition for Magneto. Create a rapidly uh, a rapidly changing magnetic field around Wolverine and his adamantium should heat up enough that he will boil alive from the inside out. I hope you're listening, Michael Metalbender. What's next? From David S. Pumpkins? The last thing that was funny in America. Anyway, what's next? My seven-year-old son wants to know how the sun works and why it's too bright to look at. Uh-oh. Hello, tiny pumpkin. Uh, the sun is a big ball of gas. Well, it was a big ball of gas outside in space. And when you have a big ball of something that weighs a lot, it has a lot of mass, as they say, all of that gas is going to want to start coming together under the influence of gravity. And if there's enough mass, has enough gravity, gravity will act to shape this thing into basically a big sphere. And when that comes together, there gets, it gets so hot and so, uh, so forceful inside of all of this gas that it starts reacting with itself in what we call fusion. And it gets so close together and it gets so hot that, for uh, all you parents watching, that uh, quantum tunneling occurs, which is the only reason why the sun goes, which is crazy. Anyway, but little pumpkin, uh, when you put enough gas close enough together and it's heavy enough, it gets so hot and so intense in the middle that it starts to undergo uh, what we call nuclear fusion. Atoms are spinning. Atoms are coming together and releasing a tremendous amount of energy, like smashing two pieces of something together. It was like that. And that explosion, more or less, powers the sun. It makes it very hot. And when something is really, really, really hot in space, it emits light, like the light that we can see. And that light travels through space. It takes about eight minutes. Yes, it takes about eight minutes for all of that light that's being produced by the explosions of fusion in the sun uh, for, for it to reach the Earth, and then it reaches our eyes. Now, why is it so intense? Why is it hard to look at? Well, the sun is very, 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 very hot, and it is producing a lot of radiation because of that. And so it hurts our eyes to look at. It's too much for our biological systems, our eyes in the back. Uh, we didn't evolve to accommodate that kind of light because we weren't always looking at the sun. We didn't need to look up at the sun as animals. We were just looking at the ground, which is just reflections of light. So less intense light, our eyes are not equipped to deal with all the kind of radiation that we get from the sun. I think that was a middle ground explanation between children and David S. Pumpkins. Something like that. Hope that answers your question. And it's mostly right. What's next? From Cosmic, 
What would happen if a large object passed between the Earth and the moon? Has an asteroid done that before? Someone can correct me. But I... Has an asteroid passed close enough that it's in between the Earth and the moon, which is 384,000 kilometers away? I believe that may have happened. Um, so what happens if a very large object does that? gets close enough to Earth that it's in between wherever the moon is in this scale of example, which would be way over there. Uh, would it? Anyway. Uh, well, unless it has a lot of mass, like the size of the moon, I don't think it's going to be doing all that much to the Earth um, because mass would be the main way it would interact with the Earth through gravity, like the moon does. Um, and it would have to come by the Earth in such a way that it's not just passing at cosmic speed, you know, many kilometers per second. I think 70 in the solar system or so. If it was just like, whew, it needs time to interact and to affect the Earth. So uh, something would have to be very heavy and moving in just the right way uh, to affect the Earth, not through something other than just impacting it, I think. Oh, oh, going back to the sun and why you can't look at it, I'm, I was kind of speculating on the evolutionary reasons why it's too intense. The, the more basic reason is that the sun puts out a lot of radiation. I mean, it's putting out so much radiation that we have stuff in our skin that needs to be produced just to protect us from the amount of radiation that it's putting out. The same kind of radiation, UVB, that mantis shrimp can see, all coming together. What's next? Oh, we can't even end on that one. What's up? Next. Who's got it? From Harris81G, can you describe the difference between a molecule and an atom, or are they the same thing? Uh, very basically speaking, uh, an, uh, a molecule is made up of atoms. Atoms are, I mean, okay, now scientists know more, that atoms can be reduced further down uh, to particles that are smaller than, like, one atom of gold or whatever. Um, but uh, atoms are the primary constituent of elements and atoms make up molecules, long chains. Up. So uh, something like, uh, remember your chemistry? Something like carbon is an atom, but something like CH4 is a molecule because it's a collection of atoms uh, connected together by the way that they are sharing or sharing their electrons, which are represented by these bonds here. And this would be methane. So constituent, atom, whole thing, molecule. M uh, a lot of things in your body are, are molecules. Long chains of molecules making up the layers of, uh, helping make up the layers of your skin and, 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 and fat and amino acids are, you know, chains of uh, proteins and molecules and uh, they can go back down atoms and stuff. So it depends on how far down you want to go. But before you get to, you know, if you go too far, if you, if you, if you see a quark, you know you've gone too far. Go a little bit further, got an atom, then you got yourself a molecule. There's also diatomic atoms, which are whatever. <laughs> I'm going too far. This. What's next? Last question. OK. From Data Bing. Data Bing? What future tech do you hope exists in Wakanda the most? What future tech would I want in Wakanda the most? I'm going to use that as a placeholder for an advanced place because I don't think the location matters. Well, maybe it's a vibranium thing. Anyway, uh, what, 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 what piece of advanced tech would I want the most? Hmm. Or, or, you know what? Uh, I'm going to punt on this question a, li a little bit to uh, say, if you never read Neuromancer, you should. It, it, it established the cyberpunk uh, genre, and it has, uh, f it's fantastically written. And it's very dense, um, but it's, it's incredible, and, and the prose is, is beautiful. Um, but there's a technology in there that they call the SenseNet. And uh, at this point, um, we, we have found a technology in the future where people are able to experience your nervous system 
feel everything you feel, see everything you see, um, you know, feel heat. So someone could uh, jack into the matrix and then jack into your nervous system and that person could, you could be walking around and that person would feel the wind on your skin, feel what you, uh, you know, taste what you eat, see what you see. And it, it, it creates an entire industry where people kind of like Instagram influencers just follow certain famous, beautiful people who eat the best food, who go on the best vacations and they just sit there Watch, feeling it, literally feeling it from the comfort of their own homes, like, you know, like, uh, like watching a travel show, but turned up to the max. And I think that kind of technology is absolutely fascinating to think about. So there you go. And read Neuromancer and watch The Expanse. Thank you so much for watching another edition of Because Science Live. As usual, if I got anything wrong, I apologize. I try to say when I don't know something, but if I made a grave mistake, let me know in the YouTube comments. Thank you so much for watching. If you want more of Because Science, you can check it out on youtube.com slash because science, where you might be right now, or facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on Instagram and Twitter. Leave me your comments, questions, corrections, all that stuff. That's where I look at it for shows like Footnotes and for stuff like this live. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend. And please remember, even though you are watching me digitally and you interact with most people digitally in your life, probably, oh, geez. Be nice to each other. There are people behind these, this apparatus, and this is all we got.